We will start with 36 and work through 1610. So Acts 15, 36 through 1610. Let me read these words now. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with him John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with him one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed having been commanded by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul came also to Derbe and Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for, for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in faith, and they increased in numbers daily. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Let's pray. Father God, be with us now. For the teaching and preaching of your word, we pray that your spirit will speak through me this morning, that your spirit will open up the eyes and hearts of my brothers and sisters this morning. May you be honored by the preaching of your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Many of you will remember from, well, actually over 10 years ago now, about 12 years ago, President Bush standing on the deck of an aircraft carrier with a banner behind him. How many of you can remember what that banner said? <laughs> I'm sure there's more than one. Ben, if you could put that up there. This is what the banner said. Mission accomplished. Saddam Hussein had been deposed. Iraq had been taken control of. And honestly, we looked at it and we said, well, yes, this makes sense. Well, it wasn't long after that the will started coming off, right? Things hadn't been quite accomplished. Everything hadn't been taken care of that needed to be taken care of. And of course, here we are, February 2016, and we are still dealing with the fallout of what happened there. I think that probably Paul and Barnabas we're in a similar situation to what President Bush felt at this time. You can take that down now, Ben. What President Bush felt at this time, because President Bush felt like, okay, things have been accomplished. This is good where we are. Look at everything that's been done. He had no idea what the future held, right? None of us do. But I can see Paul and Barnabas. They had, they had made this trip to Jerusalem, right? And they had made it for the, for the express purpose of defending the fact that Gentiles should not have to be circumcised. For them to enter into the new covenant, they shouldn't have to do this. Because remember what the Judaizers had been saying? This is wonderful. This is wonderful that you're a follower of Jesus. We are followers of Jesus as well, but you must be circumcised. Paul and Barnabas stood against them in this. And it was such a problem that they decided we must go to Jerusalem. And that's what all last Sunday was about, right? The, the Jerusalem Council that we know of today. That's how we know it today. Thank God they went down there. Thank God that Peter was there to speak against this. Because again, what if they had said yes? What if James, the brother of Jesus, had not stood up and made the proclamation that he had? Christianity would be very different today. 
But they went down to Jerusalem. Peter spoke, and then they spoke, and then James spoke, and it was decided that no, the Gentiles do not have to be circumcised. Mission accomplished. What a glorious thing. And so Paul and Barnabas think, okay, this is great. We've done what we set out to do. So now let's go back. Let's go back through the cities. Let's go back and encourage those, the churches that have been established. Let's go back through and encourage our brothers and sisters. And not only can we encourage them into word, but we can give them news. We can give them news of what has just happened, of what the council has now said. And can you just see it? Paul and Barnabas, they're making these plans there and they're getting, getting excited. I mean, we're talking about brothers here, right? Brothers in Christ. They have been through a lot together. And so they're getting ready for this trip. And then Barnabas is like, hey, great. I'm, I'm excited about this. Just hold on. Let me go get my cousin, John Mark, so he can go with us. And he just sees this look come over Paul's face. No. We're not taking Mark with us. Now, John Mark is Barnabas's cousin. And so already, you're talking about a family member. And you're saying, you don't want my cousin to go, but more than that, you don't want another brother in Christ to go with us. What's, what's going on here? And so these plans that they had, these wonderful plans of going back and, and encouraging the church came to a screeching halt because Paul does not want John Mark to go with them. Now, why? Why would this be? We remember back in Acts 13, 3, or 13, where John left and returned to Jerusalem. Now, the John there, it just says John, but we know that that is John Mark who left and returned to Jerusalem. And Paul hadn't forgotten this. In Paul's mind, John Mark had deserted them. We're in a battle here. And John Mark has deserted his post by going back to Jerusalem. Now, we, we don't know why he went back. To Jerusalem. We don't know what was happening there. It could very well have been the, the, the life of a missionary. The life of a missionary can be tough, right? Maybe he was young and, and immature and all of these different things. Maybe it was Paul's ascendancy, kind of above Barnabas, because before it was Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Paul. Now all of a sudden it's Paul and Barnabas. And so Paul has kind of risen in ascendancy. Well, this is his cousin, Barnabas is my cousin. Maybe there was something happening there. Maybe Paul was just hard to be around. We just don't know, right? I mean, I can imagine Paul having like this A personality, A++ personality. Maybe he was rubbing him the wrong way. The fact is, we don't know, and anything that we say about that would be speculation. What we do know is that John Mark left, and Paul hadn't forgot it. And Paul did not want someone, did not want a weak link on his team as they were about to go back out and proclaim, or not proclaim the good news, but to continue to encourage people in the good news, the churches that had already been established. So everything changes at this moment. There is an impasse between, between Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas wants John Mark go. Paul says, no, that's not happening. So an impasse happens. And I can only imagine how hard this was. Because we read these words and we think, oh, they, they had a disagreement, so therefore they split ways. And, and so Paul took Silas and Barnabas took John Mark, his cousin, and they split. And they went their own separate ways. We're dealing with human beings here. And when, you're, when you've been through it, like Paul and Barnabas have been through it, this isn't just in simple, oh, well, this, I, it's just not going to work out. We'll see you later. Hope you do well. Can you imagine how hard this is? To, to have a falling out with a brother who means so much to you, you have been in the trenches with this person. And now you're in an impasse, and you cannot continue down the same path together. They had no, I'm, I'm sure in their wildest dreams, they never imagined leaving Jerusalem separated from one another. Certainly not in a situation like this. Yet, here they are. They had a particular dream and they had a particular idea of what the future was going to look like and now that had completely crumbled before them. Have you ever had that happen to you? I think I could probably go around and ask every single one of you individually and you would say yes. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's a reality of, of living, isn't it? That we have a particular view of the future and it changes. Something happens 
whether it's a falling out that we have had with someone or a circumstance changes, whatever it may be, the variables are unlimited, right, as to what can happen. But the fact is, at the end of the day, what has happened is our plans aren't going to be carried forward in the way that we thought they were. For myself, I mean, Summit Ministries, I worked there for 12 years, absolutely love Summit to this day. And when I was there, I could not imagine doing anything else. Matter of fact, it was only about a, a, a couple of years probably before I actually left Summit Ministries. And I remember sitting at a conference and, and John Hay, a good friend of mine, was teaching. And I was, he, we were kind of double teaming this conference that we were at. And I was sitting there and I was thinking, Lord, thank you. I can't imagine being anywhere else. And two years later, I had resigned Summit Ministries and was on full-time staff at the church, Front Range Alliance Church, where we attended. It was during that time that I thought, Lord, thank you. I love it here. I, I, I love working with the people that I work with. I love serving the local body of believers here in the way that you have called me to serve them here. I can't imagine doing anything else. And here I am in Charlottesville, Virginia now. God directs our lives. He changes things. He changes our heart's desires, right? He started doing a, a heart change in me to where I had started having more of a, a heart and love for the local body versus what I was doing there at Summit Ministries. When I was at Front Range Alliance Church, he started doing a work in my heart to where all of a sudden he showed me, you're a pastor, Todd. You're not a church administrator. You're a pastor. That changed the direction of my life. And here we are, three and a half years into being here in Charlottesville, Virginia. Things change. There's absolutely nothing wrong with, with having plans and a vision, right? Those are good things. In any, any area of our life, not just a ministry area, but in any area of our life, it's good to have plans and a vision and so forth and things that you're working toward. The problem is when we hold to those things so tightly that we become, that when God intervenes, when God changes that plan, we get upset. We're disappointed. And don't get me wrong. Those are natural human emotions. And so when things happen, Paul and Barnabas, did they walk away clicking their heels because they were happy? No. These are men. And I'm sure there was great sadness there at the change that had occurred in their life. But I think at the end of the day, they realize, okay, God's doing something here. We don't know what it is. And so when God does something in our lives, at the end of the day, even when we are struggling, and it is really hard, we have to submit to the fact that this has been ordained by God. I don't like it right now. This is really hard right now. But this is what God has ordained for my life. And so I will move forward in this, with that knowledge and that understanding knowing that God knows what he's doing, even when, it, when I look around and I can't figure it out at all. God knows. We see a couple of other examples of that, right? Where they had a plan, they were here, they were, Barnabas and Paul were going to go out. Well, that's changed now. Now Paul and Silas are together, Barnabas and Mark are together. Now we don't, re Luke doesn't tell us any more about Barnabas. So we don't know exactly what happened here feel pretty confident that Barnabas probably had a very fruitful ministry after this. But Luke starts to travel with Paul, right? And he, he travels with Paul a lot. And so we find out a lot more about Paul and Silas and Timothy and what happened with them. But we also read that they had plans and a vision when they left. They had ideas of going into different regions and they were going to proclaim the gospel in these different regions. Well, God closes the doors once again. They had a particular plan and God says no. I have something else in mind for you. So that's where we are now. Beginning of chapter 16, Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra, he and Silas, right? And a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. More than likely, Timothy is a teenager. And I love the fact that as a teenager, what do we see here? The brothers, he was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. I love that. Here was a young man who had 
who, who had somehow set himself apart by his conduct of life, maybe by certainly the words that he spoke, his attitude, his love for other people. We don't know what all it was about him, but he was certainly well respected by the brothers, Christian brothers that were there with him, that were able to see him every single day. We're talking about a village here. We're talking about a town where they see each other all the time. And you see each other in, in good and the bad. And they thought enough of this young man, Timothy, this teenager, to think highly of him. Evidently, his, his mother and grandmother, his mother being Eunice and his grandmother Lois, we know this from 2 Timothy, where we get their names, had done a wonderful job of raising Timothy in the word, helping them to understand the Jewish traditions. But now we understand that they're believers. And now they've started to raise Timothy in an understanding of who Christ is. And they are continuing that training. And so now the church is being established in Lystra and, and Timothy and his mom and grandmother are there and they're learning together and Timothy is continuing to grow. And it says here that Paul was so impressed by this young man, that's what we kind of infer from this, right? Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him and he took him and circumcised him. There's that word again coming up, circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. <clears throat> now, wait a minute here. For, in verse 4 here, we have them going out into the cities and delivering to them the message, what? From Jerusalem. What they had just learned. What the council had just decided. What had they just decided? that they didn't need to be circumcised anymore. That they were free from that. They, they, weren't, they weren't obligated to do that anymore. What, what's Paul doing here? Because if we go back to verse 3, he has Timothy circumcised. Is there a compromise here? Is that what Paul is doing? Is Paul compromising on his beliefs? On what he thinks is right and wrong? On, and, and how we should follow Jesus? And, and, and what should be, what we should do to be a true follower of Jesus? Is that what's happening here? Well, I think when we look at the verses, it, it makes it very clear as to why Paul is doing this. First, we know that he was half Greek, right? Timothy, he was half Jew, I'm sorry. He was half Jew and half Greek. And since he was half Jew, his mother and grandmother had raised him, again, in the Jewish, Jewish tradition. The people there knew him as being half Jew. They knew his, him as being um, someone who was dedicated to the Lord. But they also knew, Paul knew, that when Timothy goes out to accompany him, and they went out to all the different places, they knew that there were going to be Jews in all of these different places, right? Because he says it here. Took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places. Paul did not see this circumcision as, of, of Timothy as something that needed to be accomplished in the way that the Judaizers did. For them to be fully brought into the new covenant, he needed to be circumcised, Timothy, as a half-Jew. What he saw, because we see, right, in, in Galatians 2, we see Paul fighting against this when they wanted to circumcise Titus, Titus who, who was a Gentile. They wanted to circumcise him, and Paul is standing against that. He is fighting against that. Why? Because of all the reasons we talked about last week. This is not a requirement to come into the new covenant. It is not a requirement to be a follower of Christ. It is by grace through faith that one is saved. Paul understood that. Paul got that. We see that in Galatians. We see that throughout the epistles that Paul wrote. What he is doing here is saying, listen, Timothy, you're half Jew. Because you're half Jew, when you go into these different cities that we go into, there are going to be many, many other Jewish brothers and sisters there. And if you're not circumcised, it's going to be a barrier to them. So this was a complete mission decision. What is going to help us become more effective, be more effective, as we go out and proclaim the gospel? You not being circumcised could very well be a barrier to us getting a hearing by our Jewish brothers and sisters. So therefore, Timothy, 
you need to be circumcised. Well, once again, we know the type of person Timothy is because we see it throughout the New Testament, right? But I think this in and of itself is huge because Timothy understood the importance of this. And Timothy voluntarily said, okay, I'll do this. That shows you the heart that Timothy has for people. That shows you the heart that Timothy has for his fellow Jews. He didn't want to be that stumbling block, that stumbling stone. He was willing to do whatever it took to make sure that that was taken out of the way. And so that's what we see happening here. So no, Paul wasn't compromising. Paul wasn't, wasn't doing anything contradictory here. Paul was doing what Paul always does, right? He was doing whatever was necessary to be able to proclaim the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9.20, to the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win the Jews. Now, in this particular instance, he was calling Timothy to do something to become more like the Jews. And Timothy did it. But that was Paul's modus operandi, right? He, anytime he went into a city, he would do whatever he needed to do within boundaries, right? He would never do anything dishonoring to Christ. He would never do anything that was in opposition to his beliefs as a follower of Jesus. But when he could, he would take on the customs of that culture. He would speak in the terms of that culture. And that's what we see happening here. And then we get to Acts 6 through 10. Acts 6, 6 through 10. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel there. If you could bring up that map, Ben, please. So here we have the, the map of them, of, of now Timothy as well. So Paul and Silas and Timothy, we have a team of three that have come together. And now they are making this trek. And, and as, we, as we read here, we can see the different places that they're going, right? Through the region of Phrygia and, and Galatia. You can kind of see the, the numbers there, three and four and so forth. Having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak in the word in Asia. So if we go to Asia, that means that he would have kind of gone north by really uh, north, northeast to go up into Asia. And that's not the continent of Asia that we're talking about. It's really the province of Asia. That was a, that was a part of a larger uh, Ephesians province as well, Ephesus rather province. So that's what we're talking about, kind of Asia Minor. Not a continent, but an area. And so that's where he was forbidden to go into at this time, by the Holy Spirit. Now, how was he forbidden to go by the power of the Holy Spirit? Again, we don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us here. Scripture doesn't tell us that he had a check in his spirit, so therefore he didn't go into Asia. You can leave that up there, Ben, for a little while. It's fine. Now, we know that Paul and Silas were prophets. Did God reveal to them in some way? Were they able to come together and they shared their impression that, hey, I, this is what I'm sensing. Okay, you're sensing the same thing? Maybe. That's a possibility. Maybe there's unrest. Maybe there was no peace. And that's the reason they decided not to go into the different areas where God called them to not go into or forbid them to go into. Maybe it was more mundane, right? Maybe yet... Um, Maybe they were more, more mundane, but yet equally effective in the sense that there were difficult circumstances. And they realized if we go into this region, this is what's, what it's going to mean. There's real uh, mountainous terrain or whatever. We can't, we can't do that. So who knows? Maybe it was illness. So these are the kind of the theories out there. Some would say maybe there was illness, so therefore that's why we start to see Luke mentioned here when he says we later on in verse 10, because up until this time it's been Paul and Silas and they and they and they, and all of a sudden now we have, and when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go, we sought to go into Macedonia. So all of a sudden Luke is now added to this entourage. So maybe, maybe there was sickness, and that's why they couldn't go into these different regions. And so they added a physician, they added Luke. I don't, I don't think it was the more physical things. I do think God's Spirit was somehow revealing to them, I don't want you to go into that region. 
And so therefore they didn't go into that region. Again, speculation, because God's word doesn't tell us. All God's word does tell us is that they had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to work to, to the word in Asia, Asia. And then we go down a little bit further. And then when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go in Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. I think we look at the words and what it says, and, and God's Spirit was somehow preventing them. I don't think it was physical. And so here we go, and, we, and they're going all over the place, and they're, they're thinking that we're going to go up into Asia. That doesn't work. Or maybe we're going to go up into Mysia. Well, that doesn't work either. And so God is doing something here, though, isn't he? God is funneling them. He's funneling them into the, into, into the West. And so ultimately, what do we see happening here? So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And we can see where they are here at Troas, number nine up there. So that's where they are. And they're trying to figure it out, I'm sure. Lord, what is happening here? We had this plan. We had this vision of going into these different areas, proclaiming the word, yet you're not allowing us to. Don't, don't you want us to proclaim the word everywhere? Why would you forbid us? Were they asking those kind of questions? Probably. They're, again, they're human. Now, at the foundation of these questions, Lord, why will you not let, allow us to enter there? Maybe even at the foundation of those, those questions, they are still thinking, but Lord, you are sovereign over all. And if you're redirecting our path, you have a purpose in it. I think they probably were. In, in Philippians, <clears throat> when Paul is, is, is writing to the Philippians, and he's in jail, and, and he's talking about what's happening in, in his life. He talks about the fact that even in his hardship, God is using it for the good of the gospel because the gospel is going forth. And so Paul has this understanding that even when things aren't going my way, even when things aren't going the way that I had planned for them to go, even when I'm in circumstances and a situation that I don't like necessarily, it's not pleasant, God is using it for the glory, or for, the, for the proclamation of the gospel to go forward. We see this throughout his writings. That is his undergirding, his foundational belief about everything. Nothing happens at random. Nothing happens just because. Everything happens because God has an ultimate purpose in that. And I think that that's exactly what they were thinking as they were making their way, and God was closing this door, so they go somewhere else. God is closing this door. Now, wouldn't it be nice if God would just tell us straight up, hey, listen, you're not going to be going into these regions, so don't even go that way. Just start heading this way. I'll tell you when you get there while you're there, okay? But God doesn't do that here. Why is it? Why is it that God allowed them to go to different areas, stay there for a little while, doors closed so they had to go somewhere else? We don't know. But obviously God had something that he was doing in them. There was something that he wanted to do in the cities that they were in, but maybe there was something he had to do in them. Maybe there was something he had to do in each one of the, the men. Paul and Silas and Timothy. Maybe there was something he had to do as a team, teach them together so that they would be more effective. So they weren't allowed to go here or there, but he was funneling, funneling them over here for his purposes. But before they got there, they needed to learn something. He had to change them in some ways. That's a possibility. That certainly is true for us, right? When things don't go our way, Oftentimes, God uses that in our lives to teach us something, to train us something, to change us in some way, to maybe point things out about ourselves. And I've had this happen, and I'm sure you have as well. And you praise God, and you think, oh, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for not allowing that to happen. Because if that had happened, and I thought that was what, I, what should happen in the direction I should go, if that had happened, it would have been a complete, complete catastrophe. Because I wasn't ready for it. I had a wrong mindset about it. I wasn't thinking right. Honestly, that was more about me than it was about you. So thank you for shutting down that door, for closing that opportunity. 
because I see ultimately now that wouldn't have been the best thing for the kingdom. It wouldn't have been the best thing for me and so forth. We've been through that before. In hindsight, 2020, we can look at circumstances and situations that if we had gone in that direction, it would have been bad. Paul understands that God is in control. He understands fully and believes fully. I believe what James tells us in James 4.13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or I know, brothers, <clears throat> excuse me, brothers and sisters, who oftentimes end their sentences with, "Well, Lord willing." And I'm just going to be honest with you here. There was a time in my life, yeah, yeah, I, and that's, I would think, yeah, yeah, I know, Lord willing, Lord willing. But that's what God's word says, right? This is the kind of attitude that we should have. Even things such as, hey, I'll see you this Sunday, Lord willing. Because we are here, but just for a moment. Just for a moment. What does it say here? For you are a mist that appears for a little time. And we make our plans, and we think we know the way. We think we know what needs to happen. And God says, no, you don't. You are but a mist. Do you understand? So in all of your ways, understand that I am the one ultimately in control. And you will do this, and you will do that, even go to church on Sunday morning, if I will it. God is in control. If the Lord wills, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. We are amidst in the grand scheme of things. We are here for an instant. Our personal empires will, will crumble. But what we do for the Lord will last for all eternity. We can dream great things for God, and I think that's a good thing. I think it's a wonderful thing when we, when we dream big plans for God and things that we want to do. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. But when we do not submit those dreams and those plans to His Lordship, to His sovereignty, that's a problem. We say, Lord Jesus, this is the direction I believe I should go. This is what I believe you're calling me to. But Lord, you show me. You show me. I'm, I'm planning, I'm planning my days here, but I know ultimately you're the one that directs my steps. And so I'm asking you, I'm asking you, please direct my steps. Now, when you say that, you need to really mean it. How often do we say, oh, we'll do anything, whatever you want, Lord. But secretly, we're kind of holding some things back. When, when we, when I was nearing the end of ordination and uh, Renee and I were kind of talking about, you know, what's going to happen now? What, what does this look like? We would kind of half jokingly say, Lord, we will really go wherever you want us to go. We will. Just don't send us to Pueblo. Now, Pueblo is a fine city. It's a fine town. But West Pueblo is about as barren as you can get. And so we would half jokingly, Lord, we will go wherever you want us to go, but don't send us to West Pueblo. Now, in reality, we would have gone to West Pueblo, right? We said that jokingly. But how often do we say those things? How often do we say, Lord, I will, if this is not in your plans, hey, I'm putting this out there in this direction, but if this is not your plan for me, please close the door. Please show me. Please help me to understand. But, but secretly, we're holding on to it. And God is going to have to hit me over the head with a two-by-four to make me see that this is not the direction he wants me to go. He's going to have to literally pick me up and change my direction for me to not go in this direction. That's so often the way we think, right? Even if we don't want to admit it, that's the way we think. Brothers and sisters, let us make our plans. Let us have a vision for different areas of our life, whether it's our, our ministry or our family or our vocation or whatever it may be. But let us hold it with open palms and say, Lord Jesus, this is my plan. You direct my steps, whatever that looks like. And sometimes that doesn't feel very good. Sometimes it's really scary. And sometimes it's just plain hard. 
But we have to trust that God in his sovereignty knows what is best. His plan is ultimately best, and his love for us and what he wants to do in us is absolutely best. He knows what is better for us. Now, were they frustrated with their plans being frustrated? There was probably some frustration there. Paul was not a perfect man. When that door was closed, more than likely Paul and Silas and Timothy weren't there and just saying, oh, praise you, Lord Jesus, you have, you have directed our steps, and we are going to go in this direction. Maybe they were. But maybe they were a little more human. Maybe there was just frustration there. That they couldn't do what they wanted to do. Did they have a sense that God was leading them somewhere specific for a specific purpose? Maybe. Maybe. But the fact is, I think when, when God made it clear to them the direction they were supposed to go, that's the direction they went. I, didn't th I don't think Paul was a what-if guy. I don't think Paul spent a lot of time thinking, what if? What if I let Mark come? What if Barnabas and I didn't have that, 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 that falling out? What if I had done this instead of that? I don't think Paul was a what if guy. I think Paul was much more a what is guy. This is a reality of the situation. This is what God has ordained in this particular moment, and so that's what I'm going to go with. There's no what ifs. I'm not going to be second guessing. I'm going to look at what is. This is what God has ordained. This is the direction God is leading us. And so this is the direction we will go. So many of us, and I'll put myself in that category, so many of us kind of live what if lives. What if I had done this? What if I had gotten this kind of degree instead? What if I had traveled here instead of there? Brothers and sisters, we have to leave the what ifs behind. Because there are no what ifs anymore. It's just what is. What is God doing right now in your life? What does God want you to do right now in your life? What doors of opportunity is he opening to you? What doors of opportunity, what you thought were opportunity, is he closing? Guess what? That's what is. That's what is. And so that's how we live our lives in this understanding of his sovereignty, in his understanding of his love for us, and we move in the direction of what is and not what ifs. I mentioned this a moment ago, Philippians 1.12. When he was in Rome and he was writing to brothers and sisters, he said, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has, our, has really served to advance the gospel. That's just the way Paul saw everything. He was a what is guy. This is what's happening now. And the fact is, what is happening now, God is using. God is using for his purposes. He's using them for his glory. He's using them to extend his kingdom. He's using them to change us as his children. He's using them to proclaim the gospel and may it go out further and farther. God is a what is God. So again, the overall effect of God closing doors was to funnel him directly west into Europe. Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now there's a lot of people, it's really interesting when you, when you start doing deep in-depth studies of different passages and of course you're pulling out your commentaries and that type of thing and there's all kind of speculation. Well how did he know it was Macedonia? Now, maybe it was Alexander the Great and so everyone knew Alexander's image and so he knew it was Macedonia because it was Alexander the Great. Maybe it was the physician Luke there. Maybe he had a vision of him calling him over into Macedonia. And there's all these, all of these speculations. And I'm not against speculation. I think it's fun at times. And so in one of them I read, how did he know that it was a Macedonian? Maybe it was Alexander the Great. And I thought, well, wait a minute. It actually says here, come over to Macedonia and help us. I think that's a clue. This is a Macedonian saying, come to Macedonia. We need you. Now, you know what it's like when you hear someone calling for help, right? If you have a child and you hear them in distress, what does that do? I don't care what you're doing. You set it down, you throw it down, whatever you need to do, and you go help. If you hear someone in distress, period, what does it do? I mean, there's a sense of purpose. There's an excitement. Oh, I'm needed. I need to go help. What's happening here? I think for Paul, it was kind of the, a similar thing. 
doors have been closed, doors have been closed. We don't know exactly, God, what you're doing here. We're trusting you. But all of a sudden, the vision comes, and they are calling for Macedonia for help. Paul knows exactly what that means. We are going to go into Macedonia, Donia, and we are going to proclaim the gospel. Now, this is not the first time the gospel had been proclaimed in Europe. It had already been proclaimed there before. But this, what we see God doing here is he really kind of goes in and sets up a beachhead for the gospel to go forth throughout Europe. That's what we see here with this Macedonian call. Is God calling him in to, to create a beachhead so ministry work, gospel work, goes out from there. And I love the fact that it says here, and when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we saw, so that means Luke is on board now, he's part of the team, and when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. This concluding here, and he talks about we, this isn't just Paul having this vision saying, all right guys, pack it up, we're going to Macedonia. Paul goes to them, evidently, from this word concluding, it's an, it's an very old Greek word that really means to coalesce or to knit together. And so here's Paul saying, guys, this is the vision that I had. And all of a sudden the guys hear this vision and they're like, that means we're supposed to go, Paul. Every single one of them, to a man, we're supposed to go. There is no doubting this. Let us go. They are knit together in one purpose. What is that purpose? To go to Macedonia and to help. And so that's what we see happening here. Now, why did God not tell him up front? We, we just talked about that. We don't know, right? We can ask the same question today. God, why, don't, why didn't you show me that's where we were going? Why did I have to go through this circuitous route to get here? God doesn't tell us those things. All he says is, follow me, obey me each step of the way. I'll direct your steps. Yeah, when you get to ultimately where I'm taking you, you may look back and it looks like a bus route around the roads of Albemarle County, all over the place. But I have my purposes and I have my reasons for carrying you way out here and then in here and way out here and taking you around this hairpin curve right here. I have my reasons for carrying you there. So just follow me. Step by step. So here we go. This whole book, or this whole uh, few verses that we read today, it really starts with this tone of optimism, right? Mission accomplished. We've done what God has called us to do. We have come to Jerusalem. We have made the point. James has made the proclamation. Now we're going to go out and we are going to tell everyone what has happened at the council. But then the brakes are put on. Barnabas and Paul part ways. Silas and, and Paul leave. They pick up Timothy along the way. And what do we know about Timothy? We, and we know that there were two letters written to him, right? Paul mentions him six times in greetings by Paul. Ephesians, we see that he withstood great pressures with Paul. We see that as the end of the days came for Paul, Timothy was right there with him. Really, Paul looked at Timothy as kind of a son, a spiritual son. He was a co-worker. He was a confidant. He meant so much to Paul, and ultimately he, meant so much, he means so much to us today, right? If they had left Paul and Barnabas together, would this have happened? Again, those questions that we don't know the answers to, that's the what ifs. All we have here as before is what is. So we praise God that that Paul used, that God used Paul in such a mighty and powerful way in the life of Timothy, discipling him, raising him up, and because of that, we are the beneficiaries of a godly man, Timothy. John Mark, we had, they had this falling out, right? That's the whole reason that Paul and Barnabas didn't go, because Paul was holding it against John Mark for, them, for him leaving them, deserting them. Praise God that something happened later to show him that John Mark had grown and matured and he was dependable. 2 Timothy 4.11, we have Mark writing to Timothy. He says, hey, get Mark and bring him with you for he is very useful to me for ministry. Something wonderful had happened over those intervening years 
Mark had grown in his abilities and in his ministry. Paul had taken notice, and obviously they had worked together multiple times over the years. And so there had been a reconciliation there. Also, there must have been some kind of reconciliation between Barnabas and Paul from what we read about in 1 Corinthians 9, 6. So praise God that, that what we see happening, even though we don't understand things, God works them together. God uses them. Uses them. God grows us so he can use us more powerfully for his ministry purposes. And that's exactly what we see happening here. God had accomplished his mission. What he needed to do at that particular time in history, he did. He was directing Paul and Silas and Timothy, and he continues to do the same today for us. If we are desirous to walk in his plans, if we are willing to be sensitive to his leading, he will lead us. Even through, again, those circuitous routes here and there and everywhere. He will lead us if we will continue to follow. And even when things don't seem to make sense, as more than likely they didn't to these men at different times in their ministry, God does have it under control. Not most of the time. All of the time. Working out His purposes in us and in the world. Let's praise him this morning for that. Let's pray. Father God, help us. Help us to, to, to recognize your sovereignty in all things. Help us to, to realize that you are truly in control and that we need to continually look at our lives and say, what is? And not dwell on what ifs. Help us to see what you're doing in the here and now. Help us to to submit, surrender, sacrifice even our desires and our vision and our, our plans for the future to sacrifice them if indeed we see, Lord Jesus, that that's not the direction you want us to go. When we see that you have closed doors of opportunity, that we just knew that was the direction you want us to go, that was the job you wanted us to take, that was the person you wanted us to be with, or whatever it may be, Lord Jesus, help us to see your hand in these things. And again, when we don't understand, help us to trust in you. Help us to trust not just in your sovereignty and that you are working all things out for the good of your plan, your purposes, but also for our good. Help us to trust that. And help us to trust in your love for us. Father, we pray all of these things. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's stand together and worship in song once again.